the first episode of The Bear doesn't explain anything to the audience. There's only a couple things that happen. The main character has run out of meat, so he runs and goes to get some more meat. He invites a bunch of nerds into his restaurant and cooks some sandwiches. He hires a new girl, gets punched in the stomach, and then everybody yells at each other the whole episode, and then in the end, he throws a can of tomato sauce into the garbage. <laughs> This is the best pilot I've ever seen. The Bear has been on my watch list for a while, and I finally got an excuse to watch it. And holy goddamn, what an opening episode. This show establishes everything you need to know about its characters, settings, themes, and style in such a masterful way. Hidden beneath this frantic set of cooking scenes and arguments is all of the information that we need to understand exactly what's happening without it ever being explicitly explained to us. And to prove that, I've written and recorded this whole video having only seen the first episode of The Bear. I have seen nothing else yet. I'm gonna overanalyze this pilot and just the pilot to see what it teaches us about the characters and story, while being seemingly inscrutable. First episodes are really hard. How do you make a first episode special, engaging, and really fun to watch? Well, make it feel like it's not the first episode. The bear starts with a dream sequence. The main character walks up to a cage and gets attacked by a bear. Cut to a crazy transition shot with the lights being changed. Woo! Right off the bat, we're not just doing a cliche. It's not the main character's past or a vision of the future. It's a truly abstract dream. This is the kind of dream sequence cold open you'd save for an isolated character episode later in the show. So who is this guy? Okay, so he seems to be working at a kitchen and needs to get some meat, but he doesn't have enough Meat. He's running around the city, so it seems like he's got a lot of pressure on him, but he's also really resourceful, so I imagine he cares about this. Looks like the bills are overdue, so the restaurant's in trouble. Yeah, yeah, no, I miss him, uh, I miss him too. Oh, he misses someone? Who? Well, I guess I have to pay attention and I'll find out. Ooh, a new character. So we're introduced to our first character dynamic, Carmi and a woman named Tina. She stops him from turning off the very distracting video games because... You unplug it, it won't work again. Ah, I see, she knows more about this place than he does. You cut vegetables like a bitch. He must be new. Carmi calls her chef. Don't wipe your hands on your apron, chef. Jeff. <laughs> That's really funny. Tina completely misunderstands him. So Tina's definitely been working here for a long time, but not Carmi. It seems like they don't even really get along that much. Do not touch that. That's my pod, Jeff. Then Carmi tweets about a video game tournament and it goes wild instantly. Okay, this guy or the restaurant must be a little famous. Okay, another new character, Sydney, appears, handing him a resume. Oh, no way. He's the one handling the resume and hiring her. He must actually be the owner. So that conversation with Tina earlier is more interesting than I thought. He's only just got here and is making decisions, and she's not too happy about that. This scene with these characters informs another relationship with another character. Nice. This girl, Sydney, has gone to culinary school with a pretty impressive career so far. Carmi then asks this. Okay, so what are you doing here? This confirms that this place is not where star chefs go. Okay, so this guy must just be really aspirational, wanting to call everybody chef, under a lot of stress, and not taken really seriously. This guy must just be an annoying rich kid who inherited the place. I'm understanding it now. I know who you are. Oh, word? You're the most excellent CDC at the most excellent restaurant in the entire United States of America. What? Turns out Carmi is also overqualified to be working in this place. What is he doing here? What are you doing here, I guess? That's what I just said. Making sandwiches. Oh, what? You're not going to answer the question, but I really want to know. Okay, so he must be a private person. But now that the question is out there and left unanswered, I'm left wanting the answer more. Why is he here? Guess I gotta keep watching to find out. Tina calls Carmi Jeff again. Please, Jeff. I need my fennel first, Jeff. Showing that she does not respect his desire to run this place like a kitchen that he is used to. There's a lot of friction here from him and the staff. Don't mess up our place! I mean, it looks like everyone here gets along. This is a really close social kitchen, but Carmi is so out of place. Sydney is also out of place. These guys are underdogs. I want them to do well. Guess I gotta keep watching to find out. Oh my God, another white guy. Here comes Richie. Fucking with my program cousin. And this guy sucks. Apparently he's this guy's cousin. And Pleasure to meet you, sweetheart. Don't oh, say sweetheart. Oh, oh, sorry, man. Carm, you're so woke. Why is he being so obnoxious? Fuck you. Bro, why are you slapping him? Jesus. Okay, who's this guy? Why's hap- <sighs> That was a lot. I need to calm down. Nothing so far is being explained clearly and straightforward, which is kind of unique for a pilot episode. In everything that's happened so far, there's been no straight up exposition scene. We're just right in the action, too caught up in the stress of preparing for this dinner, and we're just along for the ride. Characters explaining who they are and what they're doing is a necessary evil in fiction. And whenever you meet someone new and the first thing they say to you is a big monologue about who they are, that's kind of boring. You talk too much. Here, the pilot does maybe the best kind of character exposition there is. Having someone who isn't the main character explain who he is to himself. <laughs> Are you aware of the nickname the people of France have given me? This is a character reason to give us the exposition. It establishes a power dynamic with him, puts him in an uncomfortable position so we get some drama, and we don't have to have him giving us this really dry information. This episode is just one afternoon of kitchen preparation for a big event at a restaurant. We don't even get to see the event. It's frantic. People are screaming at each other. Schemes are being pulled to make sure that they get the right ingredients, and the recipes are changing on the fly. There's arguments about management. We have no time for someone to sit down and explain the plot to the audience. But finally, this asshole comes in who knows the main character and tries to talk to him, asking him questions, digging into his past. Is you too much of a cocksucker to come home? Finally, we're gonna get some answers, right? And the show says no. Oh, smart ass, right I don't, I don't have time. time. You're fucking 
Richie is yelling out exposition that we want to know really fast, but Carmi is too busy to talk and keeps interrupting it. This show is too busy entertaining us that it shies away from this explanation that I'm sure many people in the audience really want to hear right now. That's the classiness of this pilot episode. It's breaking all of the rules. But what are the rules? See, back in the before times, studios didn't want to commit to shows unless it's been proven that it's good enough and could get fans on board to tune in every week. You, as the brilliant business head of the studio, receive a script for a TV show and really want to see how it would play to an audience. So you commission a pilot, get the creator to make the first episode, and just the first episode. You screen that to audiences and they really like it and they want to know what happens next. Guess what? You've already got an audience for the show. You, sir, Mr. Show Creator, can now make your show. As a result of this industry process, pilots tend to be written a little less artistically and more financially. There's really two audiences for an opening episode. The writers and directors are trying everything they can to hook in the viewer so that they keep watching and simultaneously trying to convince the big business heads, their own bosses, that this show is engaging and leaving plot threads in the open to be explored later. This sometimes leads to spending a lot of money on your pilot episode, giving the false impression that the whole show is going to be like this when really you don't have the money for it, or leaving big open questions that you really don't have an answer to yet. The best way to navigate the temptation to open big and strong is to make your pilot reflective of the overall style of the entire show. You can write your hooks and mysteries in a way that will seamlessly bleed into the rest of the show itself when it gets picked up. In The Bear, we're launched into the middle of the story. It puts the onus on the audience to pay attention. An effective way to make your audience care is make them have to care in order to understand the show. This doesn't feel like episode one of a show. This feels like episode four <laughs> but the steady drip of information we get through the slick writing gives us answers to these questions that we have buried in the conflict. So let's find out what the fuck is happening. Richie bursts into the story with an energy totally different, yet similar to Bear. After all this passive-aggressive tension, we finally have an honest-to-goodness antagonist to finally give us some hard conflict containing the vital answers that we need to understand what the fuck is going on. You need some conflict in your story? Throw an asshole in. But all we really get is some familial relationship stuff. Richie took care of Carmi's mom, Richie's getting divorced, and Carmi was away from home for for a long time. Huh? This is your brother's house. I was running it fine without you. Why didn't you leave it to you then? Ah. <sighs> Finally, we get our big reveal. This place used to be Carmi's brother's and it was left to him. Tragic inheritance. This is never spoon fed to us. Information is doled out in an argumentative form. Through conflict, there's a reason the characters are explaining this. We, as the audience, are not being told something, we're just observing it. So back to the kitchen. Carmi is trying something new in the menu and nobody is understanding his terminology. Richie is getting even madder and then he throws up this book. What is this book? This shit right here made you pompous and delusional. Apparently it represents his ideology in some way. It's so nondescript. It doesn't look like anything. We don't get the easy answer like Harvard culinary textbook. We have to work a little harder to get it. I'm sorry, I didn't make it to the funeral. I don't know, I wasn't there. How long is this gonna take? Oh God, he didn't go to the funeral? How complicated is this relationship? Why did he leave it to him? I have so many questions. Once again, we get no answer. Just a quiet moment in the bathroom while he's stressing out. Carmi goes back into the kitchen to find his cousin is totally distracting everybody from work while he's trying to call a meeting. I'm trying to get some work done here, Capiche? Hold on. This dude from the hot dog stand? This is his twin brother! But as big an asshole as Richie is, everyone seems to like him. There's a sense of trust from the kitchen to this guy. He was the previous manager, so it makes sense. Even as the official legal owner, Carmi is totally alone here. He's looking at his knife, and he looks so sad before we get flashes of a person. Hmm. We can assume that this is his brother. We don't need to be told that this is his brother's knife. Ah, here comes a new person. Ah, a white woman! So this looks like Carmi's sister. They clearly love each other, but don't know how to communicate properly properly, they seem pretty estranged. I'm sorry, I just hate seeing you here. She doesn't want him to be at the restaurant either. Does nobody want him to be there except him? Richie's complaining about how Carmi has everything organized, but ooh, this guy Marcus points out exactly where the thing he's looking for is. At least not everybody is finding this transition super frustrating. Remember that book? What's going on with the book? Looks like Marcus is picking up the book. But hilariously, we don't get to see what's inside. We just see a piece of paper stuck in there and ooh, it's an award. Rising star chef, okay. But none of this is answering the big why of the story. And that's what Sugar is here for. Someone not in the kitchen, someone who doesn't know what's going on. So Sugar doesn't want Jeremy to run this place. I wrote Jeremy, that's hilarious. So Sugar doesn't want Carmi to run this place. Nobody wants him to run this place. Can someone just ask why he wants to run this place? Uncle Jimmy wants to buy this place. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to do something. I wanna fix this place. I was asking you to. There it is. He wants to make this place great. He sees potential in it and has the ambition to turn this restaurant into something special. But the restaurant doesn't need him. They could sell it. He's not taking the easy option with his new inheritance. He's doing something more difficult and deliberate. Something with intention. This is character motivation without explicit explanation. This show is going somewhere with this. Where are we going? So Marcus has a problem. The bread is too dry and Carmi gives him a weird new approach to salt. It's crumbly. The oven's too dry. You need to fill a baking sheet with water, put it on the oven floor, throw in another batch. Marcus barely seems able to process the really fast and specific 
specific instructions. Let's go back to Sydney. Oh yeah, she's nice. This guy Sweep asks Sydney how she's gonna impress everybody in the kitchen. Delicious or impressive? Delicious is impressive. He seems to like her answer, so at least she can be accepted into this group. And then in a beautiful moment, the kitchen takes lunch and we're shown that they have a gratitude tradition, affirmations over a meal. Start, I'll start. I'm grateful for Philip K. Dick. All right, teen, you're up, what's up? I'm grateful for all y'all, my friend. That's really cute. But Carmi, our main character, is not participating. Hmm. Looks like Carmi has some stuff to learn from this community, just as they have stuff to learn from him. The crowd gets rowdy outside, so Carmi goes out to quell it. But oh god, oh, oh god. Oh, oh god, no, but nobody's gonna help him. Who's gonna help him? Who's gonna save the day? Richie? You all right? Fuck you. But hey, there's a lot of people. The kitchen's gonna make a lot of money today. This is gonna be great. How fucking dope is that? Not dope at all. <sighs> so we are gonna stick with what works and you make that fucking spaghetti. But he's kind of right. As much as Carmi wants to help everybody become better cooks, clearly nobody is having it. They want things to stay the same. Nobody is on his side here, except maybe Sydney, but she has no power in the kitchen. You got no fucking idea what you're doing here. From Carmi's reaction here, it's probably true to some extent. So I guess we're gonna give up. Let's just keep the old recipe and make everyone happy. Richie does finally try Carmi's new recipe and oh my god, it looks really good. Mm. Oh, yeah. But I don't know, we've made up our mind. Maybe in a later episode, Carmi will get to try out a new menu. But look, it's our boy Marcus. Turns out that bread technique worked really well. The bread's now super soft and crunchy. You could throw down, huh? Marcus is really impressed, and then suddenly... Hey, grab me a fresh parm brick. All right, chef. Oh, yo. He's had an effect already. He doesn't need to listen to them. Stick to your guns. He believes that this is gonna work. Fuck the spaghetti, keep going. A powerful first episode. Wait, this is kind of like Star Wars. Star Wars was conceived with the idea that you're launching into the middle of a story. Fuck it, episode four, catch up. Nothing in the first act is explicitly explained. The setting is just lived in. Things are already in motion and we have to turn our brains on to figure out what's going on. Carmi is like Princess Leia. Princess, <laughs> Princess Leia has a home, but we never see it or really understand what her life was like there. We're introduced to her when she's in the middle of executing her plan and her home gets blown up without much context. What's engaging about the bear is what's engaging about Star Wars. We don't get bogged down with the formal introduction of our main conflict or goal. Carmi's already trying to achieve it. Everything you need to know about this story you can understand without having to use boring screenwriting tropes. We don't need to introduce him in a safe place of comfort. We don't need to show him finding out about his brother's death or understand his whole backstory and meeting all the characters for the first time. That stuff is effective, but it can get really tiring for audiences who have seen it too many times. The more interesting way to do it, the way the bear does it, is to respect the audience's time. Establish things subtly and through relationship, not by going through the motions of the plot, but jumping into the plot already underway. We're the ones figuring out what's going on in the kitchen, not the characters. Except for... I'm Luke Skywalker, I'm here to rescue you. Sydney is Luke Skywalker here. Anything crucial that we need to understand gets communicated to her, not our main character. The point of view character can be so annoying to follow sometimes. All they do is ask questions. This is why Luke comes off as a really whiny kid in the first Star Wars. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Get the fuck out of my room! I'm playing Minecraft! But take that point of view responsibility off of the lead character and give it to a supporting character, and we have a mysterious, engaging protagonist that we want to figure out. This show doesn't spoon feed you, it's serving you select dishes, and you will figure it out if you pay attention. And finally, Richie is Han Solo. In the climax of the first episode, we get a full-on Han Solo moment. The scoundrel comes in clutch to save the hero out of a tough spot, and to make sure that the mission goes ahead for a success. We are gonna be on our best Behavior. Maybe he has a heart of gold too. I don't know yet. I haven't seen the show. Even if it's not deliberate or remotely intentional, this is how George Lucas hooked an audience. And I think something very similar happened here. That's my hot take. The bear is Star Wars. <sighs> so I've written and recorded this without seeing the rest of the show. I know people are not going to believe me, but here's my screenshot of Disney Plus. It's not irrefutable proof, but I know that I'm telling the truth. I don't care if you don't believe me, but here's what I think that the show is about. Based on only the information hidden in this episode, a star chef who is wickedly talented and ambitious, who has suffered a tragedy, left with the responsibility to run a small restaurant, he feels compelled to try and improve it, make it successful, and make really great food. They're not willing to let go of their old system and will fight him back on it continuously. He's socially closed off from the staff, but also from his own family. He will need to form bonds with the team and repair his familial relationships. Sydney is an ally in this, who speaks the same language as him. The young blood will teach the old guard how to cook with excellence. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the old guard will turn out to be brilliant, talented cooks when they're freed from the shackles of their tradition. The antagonist of this show is Richie. While he will serve as the driving interpersonal conflict, they are also on the same side overall. The restaurant is their priority, and the arguments on how to take care of it will get really dirty and personal. While at first Carmi's ideas are falling on deaf ears, it seems to be having some effect on the people working for him. As shown by the ending, when his chefs are with him, it gives him the confidence to keep going even when he feels like giving up. But what's the bear? What's the bear about? It's Carmi. 
He's the bear. This show is about Carmi. The crazy dream sequence at the beginning was all about him and his own personal anxieties. It's an abstract representation of all the pressure that he's putting on himself in order to be great. But he's the one opening the cage. He is the one letting the beast out and it will swallow him if he doesn't keep it under control. This is basically telling us that this entire show is gonna be about this one guy. It's nice to watch a pilot that doesn't feel like it's going through the motions and is simply trying to tell you the story straight up. Okay, now I'm gonna go watch the bear. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Full disclosure, uh, I had to scrap a long 40 minute video but trust me, you didn't want to watch it. It was fucking terrible. I kind of got to rework it from the ground up and I'm going to make other videos in instead. These sexy names here have still supported me even though I haven't uploaded a video in so long. Come on down to Patreon where you can watch this video without ads. All right, give this video a like. Have a good time. I love you.